Welcome to To Serve With Love podcast. I am your host, Brenda Flores Robles, and today I have the legend. I have the author, the writer, the voice of freestyle with me, Latif Mercado. Hey, hey, thank you. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Yeah. So how did you get into uh, freestyle? Oh, God. Freestyle. How I got into freestyle? Well, I have to go back a little bit further than freestyle to kind of get you, give you an idea. You know, <clears throat> I, you know, I grew, born and raised in the Bronx, single mom, had this huge dream of being, I, I always, I went after so many things that were, you know, I boxed, I played football and then I was always into singing. I used to love to sing. I mean, I sang for everyone that came to the house and I just, I had this desire to be an artist my whole life. And, um, uh, as I got older, um, I got it, I started getting into rap. And I started, I started when rap first kicked in, I was there. I was mm -hmm. a Puerto, Puerto Rican rappers in the in, in Queens at those days, they didn't have much of a, a, a much of a chance. And I used to be out there, I used to go out there doing auditions and uh, I would rap for anybody. I would I was I was an incredible writer. I used to write, I had books and books to write. I'm talking about way in the beginning when this stuff first kicked off. And a lot of people didn't want to mess with me. They wanted my music. They wanted my raps, but they didn't want me because I was a Puerto Rican rapper. It was I didn't have the look that they were looking for. And they would mm -hmm. they would they would tell me this, and and it was frustrating. I remember signing a almost signed a contract to give away all my stuff because mm -hmm. the guy was gonna pay me, but it wasn't gonna be for me. And when I I went I, I couldn't even afford a lawyer. I went to the VLA, which was the Volunteer Lawyers of America. And mm -hmm. they broke it down for me. They said, well, they just want all your music, like anything you're writing for next. And they'll give you a few thousand dollars. It was like nothing. And um, and uh, I passed because I want to be an artist. Mm -hmm. And when I hit about um, 18, I got one of my first good jobs was in Manhattan as a maintenance guy. And it was, I got hooked up with the job for my uh, it was union job, good money. I was at 520 Madison Avenue. And... <clears throat> I used to bring my drum machine. Since I was making good money, I bought nice equipment. So I was like the only one young. In 17, 18 years old, I was buying, I was buying this equipment and building a studio in my house. And back then, you couldn't, you know, the studio back then to building your house was expensive. A little unit you could buy for, you know, $99 now, $100 cost like $500 back then. So I started building this studio and I would I would produce these records for myself yeah. and put them on a cassette and I would walk around with my with my Walkman. And mm -hmm. when I was at the, I also had this really cool, it was called RX, uh, RX-11 drum machine, a Yamaha black sleeve. I actually put it in a briefcase and I carried it to work in a briefcase. Like, but inside this briefcase was, was a drum machine. I used to sit there and make beats. And they, in the job, they used to have me ride the elevator. And since I was in the elevator, I used to have to drive the elevator. There was an outlet mm -hmm. right, under, right underneath my seat. So I would plug yes. the drum machine in there, put headphones, and I would beat, I would make these beats. And when some <laughs> of the other workers, this this building was like 43 stories. So sometimes yeah. people would come in that worked in the building, like the engineers and stuff. They'll say, What are you doing? And that's how they got to know me. I said, We'll put this on. I would let them hear, and we'll be 43 stories. And and I let them hear the stuff that I was programming. They were like, and they started telling me about this guy that had a daughter who sang. They said, mm -hmm. Oh man, you you gotta meet Tony. Tony. Tony's got a daughter, his daughter sings. And, you know, so me, I'm young. I'm thinking, okay, daughter singing. I'm going to think it's an older woman, which means the daughter will be older, which means mm -hmm. the guy's probably an older guy. So I paid it no mind. And then one day uh, I was in the loading dock of the job. We were doing, doing some overtime. And this guy comes up to me, young guy. Hey, man, you're the kid that does the raps, man, does the beats. So I said, yeah. He goes, yeah, how you doing, man? He goes, can I hear your stuff? I said, sure. I let him hear my stuff. He goes, can I hold on to it for a second? You know, I didn't trust anybody. I'm like, I mean, he's going to take my Walkman. Like, you know, but I saw he was a legitimate, you know, worker <laughs> in the job. I said, okay. So, so he took my stuff and I was kind of, he disappeared. He disappeared. I was kind of freaking out a little bit. I'm like, yo, man, I don't know this guy. I thought he was just going to stand over there and listen. He disappeared with my stuff. So I'm actually getting angry. So finally I run back into him and he takes this thing. He goes, yo, this stuff is really good. I'm like, oh. Thanks, man. And I took make sure I got my stuff back. He goes, can I? He goes, can I show you something? I said, sure. He goes, follow me. So his locker room. He was an engineer for the building. We were maintenance, so our locker rooms were like across the halls from each other. So I went into his locker room, and he opens up his locker, and 
in the inside's locker are all these magazine and newspaper articles and flyers of this little girl. She must have been at that time like five, six years old. Mm -hmm. I was little Susie. And he goes, that's my daughter. So right away, I'm like, oh, OK, I'm always looking for opportunities. But at that point, it didn't look like an opportunity. It was like, oh, OK, yeah. you got a cute little girl. I thought maybe his daughter was at least my age. And maybe yeah. if, if she's doing something, they can help me out. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at this little girl. He goes, by the way, he goes, she has a, her fifth birthday party at Studio 54. He says, why don't you come down? I'm like, OK. So I went mm -hmm. to the party. And the party, I didn't realize, was hosted by the village people. Mm -hmm. And it was all these celebrities for this little <laughs> five-year-old girl. And I saw her perform for the first time. And, and I remember the reaction of this crowd. Now, this is before she had a record deal. She had mm -hmm. anything going on. Um, and at that point, I, I understood who she was. I mean, she was doing major clubs. She wasn't doing McDonald's. She was doing Studio 54, the Red Parrot, 1018, the Palladium, all these major New York wow. City clubs. Mm -hmm. So when we got back to the, the building, I got now I was connected mm -hmm. to him. I was like, you know what? I, I was looking for a, a, a spot for myself. And um, and he told me, he says, he goes, you think you could write something for her? And he wanted me to write a rap for her. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I said, I could probably do something because he loved my writing. Mm -hmm. So I went home. I remember it took a couple of days. I was trying to write. And I, I couldn't come up with something because he said, write something that's about like children or whatever. And I just couldn't, I couldn't write anything for her because it didn't seem like it would fit. She was a little girl yeah. rapping. I was like, eh, I don't know, it could be cute, but it's gonna be too much of a novelty. Like, and I I had an idea for a song. Mm -hmm. I went back to him and I said, listen, I like to write, try my hand. I never wrote a regular song. I said, I like to try my hand at a song. And he said, he goes, okay. And I, I wrote a song called Children of the World, which if you get Lil Susie's first album, it was the first cut on that album. And then at that point, um, she started to perform that song. And yes. I wrote another cover song for her. And she started to perform that song. And what I started doing is I started going on stage with her. And I would open up as a rapper for her. Wow, that's okay? amazing. And we would do all these different shows. <laughs> all the place. And I was managed by her father, who was also her manager. And it was for the first time ever that my... I was already on top of, you mm -hmm. know, doing clubs that other people will not see it, especially in the freestyle genre. Like the artists that are out there now, they yeah. weren't doing anything at that time. They were nowhere to be found. So I was already doing these clubs. I was doing all these major clubs with her. And then something happened. Mm -hmm. The crack epidemic came through my neighborhood. And it swiped me up. It swiped me up in the middle of like the greatest time of my life. And it just, and it, and it, and it took over. Mm -hmm. So for about two years yeah. on the street and then three years in prison, yes, it totally took me out of the scene. And from prison, mm -hmm. I started to see all my peers start to blossom. I started watching Sapphire on, 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 doing videos and I started to see George Lamont and TKA and even in the day room was the first time I ever seen my wife mm -hmm. when my wife was this was 1988 when my wife was at the top of the top billboards mm -hmm. in New York City and doing all these major events mm -hmm. I was watching her from prison from did you know her room. then no I didn't know her I didn't know her <laughs> and so when I came out so when I finally and I continued to write and it wasn't much I could do in prison because I went upstate, but I used to study a lot. I'm a huge advocate. I, I read a lot and I started getting pretty much anything I can get my hands on that has to do with the music business. Mm -hmm. and I started to really educate myself, not really because I was trying to educate myself. I was just reading anything that I could get my hands on that had to do with business. I was just that geeked out on it. I just wanted to read anything I could get my hands, not realizing I was actually educating myself on, you on know, label. Mm -hmm. publishing, writing, distribution. I started learning publicity. I started learning all these angles, not realizing it. When I came out of prison, finally, I was ready to go. I was like, okay, I got this. I know the business. I go this. I got the connections. I'm And I'm going to go back out there. The problem is, the problem is the genre that I was going to jump into was now on a decline. 
it was starting to fall because I came out in 91, 90, mm -hmm. late 90. And, um, and the genre was basically like people at this point were struggling. There really wasn't much happening. You know, everybody already hit the peak and they were coming down. They were on their way down. And I had a problem accepting that. I had an issue accepting that. I was like, no, I can't leave now. I'm just getting out. I, had, I, got, I need my spot. I need my shot. And at that point, I started going on the road with Susie. Her father put me back in, you know, which was great, which is why I've always been very loyal to them. And because from what I went through, Mm -hmm. They still opened that door for me and they, they gave me, and it's because of them that I got the opportunity I have that I have now. And I started going on the road with her. And while I was on the road, I started rebuilding all these connections and I was able to keep her at a certain level. Susie has always maintained a really mm -hmm. you know positive level within the genre, whether it was money wise, the mm -hmm. venues, wherever she went, we, we had a good run. We, we maintained a really good run. And I used that to start pushing other artists because I saw the opportunity for her, but these other artists weren't out there. Like they were on their way out. They were done. It was just, they, they, a lot of them were getting regular jobs. So I used to talk to the promoters on the road because they used to love Susie. I said, I get you some other artists if you want. And they were like, really, who can you get? And I said, they didn't remember the songs. I used to, I used to have to sing the songs. They didn't remember the artists. I said, like, you know, <laughs> this song Dream, uh, yeah, I know him. I could, you know, really, okay. And I started, and that's how I started. I, I'm a booking agent. That's how I started working with, yes, with, as with an agent, mm -hmm. you know? So I ended up on the other side of the fence. No more being an artist. Now I'm the guy behind these artists. I'm trying to, to reignite this genre that everybody just basically gave up on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when I first uh, heard um, Freestyle, it was like, isn't it beautiful to know that we won't let each other go? Never would I say goodbye. Oh, uh, uh, Like BLA, you know what I mean? It's like, oh my. time to time, you and I. Yeah, Who's that? And then, um, BLA. Oh, BLA. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, yeah, BLA. So, so we, I would always like, Every time he's, comes he's, out. Out of, he's in Canada. He's out of Canada. <laughs> That's amazing, yeah. right? That I mean, for him yeah. to transfer over here to uh, to America, and yeah. it's a, it was a hit. It was a huge record. Huge record. Yeah. There's a big demand, especially in Texas. Texas <laughs> calls me all the time. He doesn't want to come into the states anymore. But I get calls, especially San Antonio. They call me all the time. They're like, "Hey, can you get?" So it's, it's funny that you yeah. mentioned him from all the acts, you know. But. uh but yeah, yeah you it know, was little Susie too, and then the cover girl, show me, show yeah. me, mm -hmm. you know, right. it was then three. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so we kept, you know, so I kept, you know, I kept, um, I started doing all the big shows. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, you know, the, you know, unfortunately the genre was, was the leadership in this genre was, mm -hmm. was not good. It wasn't a good leadership. Freestyle pretty much started at around the same time as hip hop. The problem is hip hop has billionaires. They have very successful people. We do not, we don't have yes. this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because the leadership within the freestyle now, yeah, there's crooks in, in, in hip hop too. But a lot of the leaders in freestyle weren't really thinking about the future of the genre. Mm -hmm. Their idea was the future of their own benefit. Yeah. What can they get today? What can they get tomorrow? They didn't think in the future. Right now, we have a generation of freestyle artists and producers and so on that are more or less, I'm, I'm 54, more or less our age. We're all around the same age. And guess what? There's no one that we're passing the torch to. So when this thing is done and we all start to drop off, there's no one to follow. This is it. And that has been my mission for the last... Mm, 20 something years is to try to maintain the integrity of the genre while at the same time trying to introduce it to other folks. And I do that through other means, which is my writing and stuff like that. Yeah, I love that. And I know you have your book, Freestyle for Life. That's one book. That's one book of many have, books that you've written. I, yeah, I have, I have, oh, it's a coincidence. I'm right here. I have, uh, <laughs> I have Freestyle, which mm -hmm. is. That's little Susie on the covers by the vampire who's a freestyle artist. If you want to learn how to do the promotions, I have freestyle promotions and the seven simple steps. Uh, and then my latest one is a three piece. 
this, these are the other ones, but it's called Yes, Yes, Y'all. And it's very similar to the story mm -hmm. that I just told you where it was a Puerto Rican kid in New York who couldn't get a record deal because of the color of his skin. And that's and that's what these books were are about. And um, I just finished those. Those are out already. All those books are available on Amazon. But um, and then I'm working on something else right now to put out by November. So, but, but I love yeah. the way you you write your um, your books because it's so much. It's so detailed. And Did you read that one? You read it? Sorry, I mean, yeah. Oh wow. Um, I love the fact that um, you go into a lot of detail, really. And it's really easy to follow. Thank you. And um, you can really see it come to life. Thanks. Thank you. And yeah. So I try I to like write it the way I want to read them. You know, I want to, I didn't want to bore people. I didn't want to, if you notice, my chapters are pretty short. I don't like long because I like to write, read per chapter. So if I'm sitting down to read, I say, okay, I'm going to do this one chapter. I can't sit there and read 100 pages of, on a chapter. I need to read just a few pages so I can put a bookmark, close it, and get back to work. <laughs> you know, so they're perfect bathroom reads. I told me, anybody boy, read, you read in the bathroom, they're perfect because the chapters are small. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, what inspires so, you to write? Like, how can you write like really fast? Like, you know, something is so weird that I can. I can write. I can write really fast, and it's so it's crazy because <laughs> so my I write. You know, I write stories come to me. Uh, of course, a lot of them are, are, are inspired by mm -hmm. my own experiences, my own life. Um, but of course, some of them, are, uh, I, I got to throw a little fluff in there for entertainment because you know, my life wasn't all that entertaining. So I have to keep it to keep it going and keep people wanting to to turn pages. Um, I had to pretty it up. Uh, a lot of the deep, dark stuff is pretty life experience. My relation, the relationships that the characters have with other people are very similar to experiences I had like with my mother and other people around and friends. And so I take a lot of those. But to write the actual story is so funny because somebody just asked me this the other day and Angel started laughing. He mm -hmm. said, how, he goes, he goes, how do you, how do you come up with these stories? Like sometimes even your blog post, you'll write a, like I'll do, I won't do just a post. Mm -hmm. I'll do a story attached to it. And um, I said, well, I'll be honest with you. I, I used to lie a lot when I was a kid. Uh -huh. I used to lie all the time because <laughs> I was, I was, I was, I was, I was, uh, a kid with a single mother. I was. Mm -hmm. I had older brothers and sisters, but they didn't live with us. So it was basically an only child. All these kids around me had their mothers and their fathers, and they had they had a beautiful life. They had. I had a great life. I ain't putting it down. But my mother did what she can. But these people went to their country for 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 vacations, and they went here and they went there as a family. And they used to come back and after summer, and everybody used to sit around. They used to talk about everything they did and. I didn't do anything. I maybe went to Disney World. I did a couple of things, but you know, I had to pretty it up a little bit. So I used to always add stuff to to these stories, and they didn't believe me. They used to be like, "Come on, man, you really did that?" I said, "Yeah, yeah." And I said, "Hold on to the story," and I I'll carry the story to the point where I believed it myself. I would tell the story. <laughs> you know, you had a great imagination. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it all played it all played a role. You know, later on, I never never saw that happening, but that's the truth. This is the truth. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so um when you um book artists um what is it like working with all these freestyle artists um it, it's an it's an it's an honor it's an honor um i have i have a lot of respect for so many of the artists listen this this because of my position and some of the things i had to stand up for there's people in this industry that really don't, they don't care for me much. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's not a secret because I stand up. I'm one of the few people who stood up against the bullies, each mm -hmm. and every single bully out there went head to head. And the thing is with these bullies is they had their own little followings. And some of those followings included some of the artists, mm -hmm. some of the artists that I looked up to, that I respected, that I admired, that I was a fan of. So it kind of hurt to get feel the rejection, mm -hmm. you know. Yes. And it, and it, and it happened in the beginning because, you know, I don't know if you know, but there's you know, there's a fake cover girl group out there, and I stood up for my wife and I stood up for the group, mm -hmm. and the people that were put in this group out there, 
um, they're the ones they had their own following. And I understood that. Like I couldn't even hate on people because of it. I'm like, yeah, you know, if I got people that are down with me, I expect them to have my back. So, yes. so I wasn't really hating, but it was, it was disappointing because you know, here you are, you, 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 you're in this genre of, of, of artists that you admire, that you look forward to knowing, get, knowing that you work with them, you meet them, but you get to know them more on a totally different level. Um, and, and then to, to, to feel that tension, mm -hmm. to feel that tension or at the very, a lot of them didn't verbally come at me or, or, but I could feel the divide. I yes. could feel the, I could feel it was very evident. But then as time went on and I proved my case and I, I stayed consistent, adamant on what I was standing for, a lot of them came around to the point where I got this. I would be at a concert and I would say hi to everybody. Everybody would say hi to me. And I'll get that one or two artists that will pull me to the side. And they'll be like, yo, Locke, can I talk to you for a second? I'm like, sure. They'll pull me to the corner. They'll say, yo, listen, I just want to say this, man. I believe in everything that you say. I have no hatred for you, man. I respect you totally. I love what you're doing, but I can't say anything. I, he says, you know, they say, I can't say anything because this, it could hurt me in this area. I'm yes. like, I, I, I know, I understand. I said, but, and I'll keep that between us. I said, but I appreciate you coming and let me know that. And it did, and it made me feel good. And it let me know that what I was doing, I was right. Mm -hmm. You know, they just you just want to be fair. You just wanted to be fair. And yeah. it's all about justice. Yeah. Yeah. So but working with them, I mean, I've worked with every major freestyle artist that you could come up with. And they're all wonderful to work with. They're all very professional. I never had issues with any of them. You know, uh, some I'm a little closer to the other to others. Um, but uh, I think we have a pretty good relationship and they all like working with me. Mm -hmm. So they they all they they all like working with me and uh, they know when I put them out there that I got their back. So it's not just book them and put them out there and that's it. I actually I check up with the promoter. Hey, I got the artist going there. Make sure they're good. They're gonna need this, 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 and that. Make sure that's taken care of. Make sure when they get there, they got their money. But you know, so I make sure that they're totally covered. You know, at the same time, I tell the the artist that's my promoter. Do the right thing. If you have an issue. Call me, I'll fix it. You know, whatever. They, this is what they're gonna ask you for. This, 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 and that. You're cool with that, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Then do that. You know, no surprises. I don't want surprises on either side. I don't want the promoter all of a sudden say, "Oh, yo, yeah, I need you to come out here and and hold up the sign in the highway." You know, I'm like, "Hey, we didn't agree to that." You know, so mm -hmm. you know, and then also if the artist is doing X amount of songs, that's what the promoter expects. Then those songs need to be done. So I make sure that both sides are, are open. And clear, and that's my job. My job is to make sure both sides are happy. That's wonderful, Latif. Yes. That's very yes. wonderful. And um, I know you have a podcast. You actually have two podcasts. One of them's free freestyle lives on stereo, and that's with your wife. What yeah. is it like collaborating with her? Well, we have another podcast. We have a bigger one that we're doing. So that one, what we did is um, stereo is cool. It's a cool app. When we got the app, um, I told I said, let's try this. But to me, it had a lot of bugs. People tell me, well, we don't get the bugs. But I think what the bugs is is because since we're doing it in the same house, we have to do it different phones. And mm -hmm. if there's a glitch in our Wi-Fi or whatever, it glitches both phones. So it really wasn't. So when you see these other people doing it, if it glitched one, like these other people doing the the, the, the co-hosting a show mm -hmm. on stereo, one lives in New York, the other one lives in London. That, that's, you know. And there's no, you know, you'll get one side glitch, but you won't even notice. But when both of us start to glitch, so I told I said, so we did something like, I don't know, like 12 episodes. Mm -hmm. And me and my wife are together almost 20 years. We can sit down every single day and talk for two hours. We have that kind of relationship. We are beyond soulmates. It's beyond that, you know, you know, and, and. <laughs> And, you know, we finish each other's sentences. One of those corny <laughs> relations. I tell, I, tell, I, said, I said, man, we got to double check, make sure we're not siblings. You know? Because <laughs> we're like too much alike. We're like twins, you know? She goes, ah, oh, don't say that. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, but no, we, we, yeah, I, I mean, I love working with my my wife. You know, listen, we live together. We play together. We work together. We travel together. And 
we have a great relationship. It's like, you know, uh, it's if I can wish anybody something great is to have that with their spouse, you mm -hmm. know, or a significant other, however you want to, you know. Um, so it's, so when we did that, uh -huh. it was cool. It's very yeah. natural. It's like we didn't have to try. Um, but we're not going to do that right now. We're like, because there's too many glitches. But we have a new podcast that we're working on called uh, Where Freestyle Lives. Mm -hmm. And that's a regular, legitimate podcast. I mean, we bought all the equipment, like we have everything. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll be setting that up. We're hoping by the summertime we should have that one up, you know. And then the other yeah. one you're talking about is Good Night Freestyle. Yes. So Good Night Freestyle last night was episode 400, 441, something like that. I was like, oh, my God. I was like, what? like how does he have the time? <laughs> no, I yeah. You do, so this was the deal with with Good Night Freestyle, right? I started it right before the pandemic. Now I'm on the road almost every weekend. I'm working here. There's always stuff to talk about. Sometimes at the end of the night, I have all this stuff in my head. I've already went at it with this artist. I went at it with this promoter. I'm trying to figure this out. I'm working on this project. I'm getting ready to leave this weekend. Then we're on the road and then the car breaks down. Then, so I have all this stuff and I'm like, man, you know, so I got on this podcast through Anchor and I said, I need something that I, I know I can take from beginning to end because I want to do something daily. Mm -hmm. That was the, that was the challenge. And I would not have attempted it if I didn't think I could make it through. So I wanted to make sure that everything else was, there was no obstacles. If I knew I had to have a camera, and I have tons of cameras here, if, they, if I thought I needed to have a camera, there might be a problem. I won't be able to do it every day. If I needed to have an external microphone, there's a good chance I wouldn't be able to do it every single day. If I had to be in a certain location, if I had to look cute, if I had to, you know, whatever the case, I had to eliminate all of those obstacles. So I said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have my, my podcast is going to be on nothing else but my phone. Mm -hmm. That's it. And so I said, okay, I could do this anyway. I could do it on an airplane, in the airport, in the elevator, in the bathroom. I could do it on the road, driving in Texas, California, Miami, backstage, in the hotel, in the hallway, which... I've done it in all those places. And I said, if I could do that, then I could, I could, I could commit to 20 minutes a day. And I started it before the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? It was easy, even yeah. though I was nervous. So if you listen to the first few, I, I'm really nervous. I'm like, oh my God, how am I gonna do this? Like, I'm not gonna get nobody's gonna want to <laughs> listen to this. So so I carried it, I carried it through. And all of a sudden, we got the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, man. So I told Angel, I said, man, I mean, how am I going to, I can't speak every day stuck in the house. What am I going to talk about? The walls, like, <laughs> today the walls look different. There's dust on the wall. Like, what am I going to talk about? I was like, talk about my dog. Like, what can I What can I possibly talk about every single day? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't want a good night free stuff to just be about business. Yeah. I wanted it to be more like a personal diary that I share with everyone. So I said, so she said, well, hang in there and just go with it. She goes, just talk about mm -hmm. whatever's on your mind. She goes, every night, you know, when you're shutting down, there's stuff on your mind where it's something you're working on because I'm always on something. I said, okay. And I did. And I started. And I said, I'll tell you this. If I can make it through the year during a pandemic in the house and talk every single night, then once this opens up, I'm back on the road, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be a breeze. And I did. And some days I'm talking a lot. Some days I'm like, well, guys, <laughs> I'm kind of like lost right now. I'll be outside. Sometimes I stand in the driveway and there might be an owl and I'll talk about this damn owl. And then, you know, I'm seeing shadows in the dark and I get emails. People are like, yo, you had me laughing last night. You thought that was a panther? I said, yeah, it was a little cat because <laughs> it was so far <laughs> and the way the light was hitting it. <laughs> so, you know, and but. But I wanted it to be transparent, and sometimes I, I get scared because I forget I'm on the phone. Yes. And I'm like, and I have to stop because I'll zone out, and I'll say, "Ooh, what, what did I just talk about? I hope <laughs> I'm not like revealing anything I'm not supposed to, you know." And um, uh, and um, but I try to be as transparent, and and I talk about some of the stuff. I kept COVID from the podcast until I knew I lived. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay? Because I figured if I didn't make it, everybody would know about it anyway. So I didn't want to talk about it because I was still scared. But once I got through it, I said, I told Angel, I said, it's important that I bring it up because there's people that have it. And I need to give them some sort of hope that it's okay, mm-hmm. you know? But uh, yeah, so episode 441, I look forward to doing it every night. It's 20 minutes long. It's on every, it's on iTunes. It's on Anchor. It's on every platform where you can listen to podcasts and, you know, and I try to get people to hang in there until we open back up and then it gets exciting again because I'll be back on the road and, uh, but yeah, it's my, it's my own little, uh, my own little thing, you know? So. Yes. Well, I want to thank you, Latif. Thank you. For being on this podcast. Absolutely. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. I appreciate um, it. I definitely see you in the future. Um, being in a museum. <laughs> the freestyle, like, or you know what? If somebody's going to create a museum, you're the to go guy for freestyle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For freestyle, you know? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate um, it. And, and good luck with what you're doing. Thank you very much. I and love it. Um, w- thank you. And I am um, work. If somebody wants to book you, um, they can just go to Latif Mercado, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, latifmercado.com. You'll find me. If you go there, it's connected to everything. It's connected to all my social media platforms. I'm on everything under my name, Latif Mercado. So, and I love to hear from people. People read my books. If they're, if they follow me in any way, I love to hear from them. You know, I get a lot of people that check out my TikToks too. And they, they go, I don't know if you've seen those yet, but I, I, I stay pretty busy and on. That's my little breakaway. It's like, okay, just that's to keep me, keep me sane, you know, but yeah, yeah Latif Mercado and you can, uh, dot com and they can catch me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for tuning in. God bless you. Okay. You too. Bye-bye.